just a minute. Okay, should be here. That's good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for the song service. So now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> And uh, as you uh, are well aware, we're getting very close to uh, finishing up this chapter, which has been, you know, one of the greatest chapters uh, that uh, we've been studying in a long time, and uh, as all the Word of God is. But again, just chock with full of information as to how to live the spiritual life. And I guess I say that about every uh, lesson that we go through. It's the best one since the last one. And again, because the Word of God is so powerful and just so wonderful and all the aspects that it has for our lives, it's just so endearing and uh, great to learn these principles and precepts as we're doing. But, you know, this chapter has been a fantastic chapter in regard to walking worthy of the calling by which we've been called, walking in the righteousness by which we've been made. We've been made new creatures, again, a new spiritual species. We've been given a new man nature inside of us, the Christ-like nature. We've been formed in the image of Christ in the spiritual realm. Now we need to walk in that each and every day. And as we've gotten to the last half of this chapter, it's all about the code of conduct and the, uh, how we should function and operate each and every day in the spiritual life. So that's what we've been noting. And again, in verses 25 through 32, remember the new man must replace lying with truth-telling. We've talked about that. We've also noted that the new man must replace unrighteous anger with righteous anger. Don't let your anger turn into sin, and ultimately, don't let the sun go down on that anger. Always turn it over to the Lord. Then in verse 27, the new man must not give Satan an opportunity to exploit sin within his soul. Again, keeping ourselves chaste by not entering into sin, not giving over to the temptations of sin. But if we do, then name and sight it rebound, 1 John 1, 9, right away, so that ultimately we don't continue to walk in sin and give Satan even further opportunity to lead us away in our spiritual walk. Then we also understood in verse 28 that the new man must replace stealing with working and giving. Rather than being a taker of society, let's be a giver of society. Remember, we are the doulos, the servants of God here on planet Earth. And ultimately, we are to be serving our fellow mankind, especially inside the church, the family of God. So again, rather than being a taker, be a giver and a contributor to society. Then we also understood that the new man must... Re must replace corrupt talk with edifying talk. Again, all our words should be building people up rather than tearing them down. And, it, and even though I say tearing them down, remember, tearing somebody down is when you communicate something that leads them into sin as well. And that could be a coarse joke, again, uh, uh, inappropriate language that you might have, or it could be verbal abusive language that you may use. Whatever the case, again, we ought to be building people up, encouraging them with the strength of the Word of God, and giving them hope and confidence each and every day. Then we also noted... <clears throat> Excuse me just a minute. Also in verse 30, we understood that the new man must not grieve God the Holy Spirit. We ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a consistent basis, but grieving the Holy Spirit is when we sin, and then ultimately we don't confess it through 1 John 1, 9, and we stay out of fellowship with God. As a result, God the Holy Spirit is not able to work within us, and it frustrates Him, it frustrates His ministry, grieves Him, saddens Him, as it were, because He wants to have a relationship with you on a 24 by 7 basis. But when you function in sin, you put the, uh, the Holy Spirit aside and you're not allowing Him to have that relationship with you inside of your soul. Now as we continue to wrap up this, uh, this uh, chapter and uh, we get into verses 31 and 32, now we're seeing that the new man must replace bitterness, anger, rage, shouting, slander, and all kinds of malice with kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. And this past week we talked about the, uh, the first list that we have of six things that the new man is to throw off, to put aside, not function and operate in. And this morning we're going to start the last three in verse 32 kindness, compassion, and forgiveness, what the new man should be walking in on a consistent basis. But as we noted in verse 31, let's just read it in our passages. Let's go there in our Bibles. It says in verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And then in verse 32, And be kind to one another 
tender-hearted or compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So these are the characteristics, again, in a summary form that we see here in verse 31 of the old man characteristics, the old sin nature characteristics that we're no longer to function and operate in. We ought to put those things off. And what's interesting about that passage, especially in verse 31, as I taught on Tuesday and Thursday night, Remember, we've been seeing nothing but imperative mood since we've got into verse 25. And the imperative mood in the Greek is a command. We are commanded to do these things. Stop doing this, start doing this, or continue doing these things. And the same thing goes here, the imperative mood. But what was very interesting about verse 31 is that it was also given to us in the passive voice. You see, the other characteristics that we were told to put off, we were given the active voice, which means we do the action of saying, I'm not going to do this any longer. But in the summary of all of this, God brings it all home by saying you ought to receive the action of putting these things off. In other words, we don't do it necessarily ourselves, but we allow God to do it through us. And it's through the Word of God and the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit that we're able to say no to these sinful types of things within our lives, say no to the temptations from the mentality of our soul or that come from us from outside. We, it's the power of the Word of God that allows us to have faith to say no to those things and continue to walk steadfastly in the will and plan of God. Why did my computer just blank out like that? I don't know. Here it goes. Okay. Whew, that wasn't too bad. Why did that do that? I don't understand. But in any case, again, it's the power of God. And that's what's in view in verse 31. It's given to us in the passive voice. And it's also a specific type of passive voice, which is also a passive deponent. It's a special type of passive uh, voice that we see in verse 31 and then into verse 32 as well that give us the connotation that we receive this thing, but the deponent also has an inkling that there is uh, the active voice as part of it as well. And so when we see that little inkling, as I would say, of the active voice in these, even though it was given to us in the passive, basically what that that is telling us, let me get my computer to cooperate here, there we go, basically what that is telling us is that we have volitional responsibility. Yes, God is the one and the power of God is the one that's going to take these six vices that we've talked about that give us a summary of really all sins that we should be putting off in our old nature and throwing off from our old nature and instead walking in the new man. But it's through God removing those things for us, the passive voice that leads us into doing it, that leads us so that we can say no to the temptation before it becomes sin, and then if it does become sin, say yes to the 1 John 1, 9 and get back into fellowship with God. And then ultimately, let me go to my next slide here, is in, instead we allow God to work within our lives, but we still have volitional responsibility. In other words, we have to make the decision to let God work within our soul. You see, that's the power of the spiritual life. You bring what? Free will to the party. Ultimately, you bring your choices each and every day. Am I going to follow God and walk in His plan, or am I not going to do that and instead walk in sin? It's our choice each and every day as to what we're going to do. The passive voice tells us God does the power. God does the action of the removal of sin within our soul. He did it at the cross of Jesus Christ, which we received forgiveness of our sins at the moment that we were saved. And then every time we utilize 1 John 1, 9 after our salvation, we continue to receive the forgiveness of the experiential sins that we are committing along the way during our spiritual life. So in other words, God does the removing of sin. He's given us forgiveness of those sins. And the Word of God and the Spirit will also help us to stop sinning within our lives, either to stop sins that we've been committing through confession of sin or not to enter into them in the first place by having mental fortitude to say, no, the Word of God says I should not do this thing, so therefore I'm not going to give in to that temptation. So here we see God working within our lives. And now let me just go back to this other slide real quick. But let's see. I want to go page up, page up, page up, page up. 
One more page. All right, there we go. But again, God tells us to not be resentful and bitter towards other people, not to have indignant outbursts, the wrath that we see here, not allow anger to fester within our soul, and don't get into verbal brawling, which is that word clamor, and what that's all about, shouting at the top of our lungs and fighting with our words. Don't enter into any kind of abusive language, whether it be gossip, maligning, slandering specifically is what's in view here. Don't get into any kind of abusive language. And then as it says, malice, and remember that Greek word for malice really talks about all evil and wickedness in general. So again, God has given us a list of sins that we should not enter into. There are many more that we see throughout the Word of God as well. In our positive volition, are we going to let the Word of God speak to us and say no to those things, or are we going to reject those things and fall into sin anyway because that's what we want to do, because our lusts and desires are leading us in that way. But remember, it's all about God working within our lives. The more we learn about the Word of God, the more we'll have resistance against sin, the more we'll rebound and recover quickly if we do sin. The more we'll say no to the temptations that God has and, uh, or for our lives. So we've got to let the power of the Word of God to work within our soul, but we have to have positive volition. That's what we bring to the table. We bring the positive volition so that ultimately we pick up and put on the new man and we wear it each and every day. Just as you wear clothes each and every day, again, wear your new man. Wear the new nature. Wear the new spiritual species that you have been created in. Wear the holiness and righteousness that God has given to you from the day of your salvation, wear that, put it on each and every day. But the only way we can do that ultimately is by taking in God's Word consistently. So now what we understand in verse 32, and let's read that again, where here we see the virtues of the new man. In verse 31, put off those old things, allow God to remove them from you, but again, bring your positive volition, your faith in God to allow these things to happen. Now in verse 32, we also see the passive voice, but in the sense of now putting these things on. This is how we should function. This is how we should operate on a daily basis. And it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So in verse 32, now we're seeing three virtues of the new man. The new spiritual species that we've been created in, ultimately we have three new virtues that have been given to us that we need to put on. And when we put these things on, remember we are expressing the love of God. As you know, Jesus Christ said, you know, the greatest commandment of all is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he also said, if you have love, you've fulfilled the entire law. And so, in other words, all the commands that are given to us in Scripture of what to do in the spiritual life and also what not to do when we function and operate in love, we're going to do all those things. So as we see kindness and compassion and forgiveness that we ought to put on and have in our lives each and every day, it's really wrapped up in that umbrella of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, loving our neighbor as we lay down our lives for our friends as well, laying down our lives in self sacrifice sacrificial giving each and every day. And that love is very powerful that we should be having within our lives, and that love tells us that we should not be entering into sin whatsoever or be participating in other people participating in sin as well. And when we love our neighbor, we're going to say no to sin. I don't know why this keeps doing this to me this morning. Steve, what would you do to my computer? <clears throat> Let me just double check here. Kind of on screen save, I think, but in any case, we'll endure. But in any case, when we understand that we ought to put on love, basically we are understanding that you know we don't participate in sin. We don't give wholehearted approval to other people sinning as well because we're just allowing them to hurt themselves and we're hurting ourselves when we enter into sin each and every day. But let me get into this verse a little bit further, and it begins with this phrase, and it's two simple words in our English, and be. Now, this word be I wanted to share with you this morning, which is ginomai, which is a little bit different from the typical be in the Greek language. 
Typically, we'd have the word aimi in the language, which just means a state of being, okay? Sometimes we translate it as is or be, depending on the case and what's going on with it. But here we have ginomai. We have de and then ginomai. Da is a contrasting conjunction, which says instead of doing these sins that we just talked about in verse 31, now put on these things that we're seeing here in verse 32. Uh, instead of God having to remove these sins from your life in verse 31, let God put these things, these attributes, these characteristics into your life here in verse 32. Now when we see that word ginomai, it's a little bit different. A bit, again, a very common word within the Greek language, but it means to become something. It's not just a state of being. It means taking on a new nature, becoming something that you were not before. And that's the command that we have here also in the imperative mood. Become what you weren't before. You see, before we were sinful creatures. Before our salvation, we were absolutely sinful creatures. After our salvation, we still have the old sin nature, and we can be led by that sin nature. So God is saying, even though I've given you a nature, become a person who lives in that new nature each and every day. In other words, become something. I guess I'll just have to keep hitting my... Uh, yeah, I'm not plugged in. That's, that's uh, not the issue. All right. But thanks anyway. Uh, but in any case, I'll just keep battling with it. But in any case, uh, become something, okay? Become something. Ultimately, this is what we are to become. We are to become kind. We are to become compassionate. We are to be forgiving. Not holding grudges against people, not having hatred and bitterness and anger and wrath and all these other things that we would have had if we lived in our old nature, the old man. But as a new man, we're going to live differently. We're going to live in a new nature. And again, the present passive deponent, I've explained that to you already, and then also the imperative mood. In other words, let God have this change in your life, but in the active voice, as it says here, as I also mentioned previously, it, that means that you have volitional responsibility. You have to make choices each and every day. You have to apply faith each and every day in order for God to have these changes within your life. So when we have faith towards the Word of God, as you're doing this morning, you have faith to come and learn something about the Word of God. And hopefully you're here, not just because this is a nice social gathering and you're getting some nice social uplifting or upheaval as a result of being here, but instead you're here because you want to learn about God's Word. You want to learn about how to live life unto the Lord each and every day. And because you want to learn those things, again, you've used your positive volition to get up out of bed, take a shower. Hopefully most of you did that this morning, just kidding. But take a shower, get in your car, drive as long as you had to drive. Some people are driving more than an hour away to come here and ultimately learn the Word of God. Why is that? Because you want to know how to live your life unto Christ. You're expressing positive volition. And by expressing that, now you've left yourself open for God to bring that change into your life. You're now allowing God to use His Word ultimately so that... <clears throat> oh boy, now it wants to restart. Hold on just a minute. I'm going to fight this thing all day, but I'm going to win. No, the Lord's going to win. The Lord's going to win. But ultimately, you are doing it because you, you want, you've opened yourself up so that now God can work within your life. God can work within your soul and make the necessary changes. Because again, we can't just keep living the old lifestyle. We can't just keep living in the sin that we've lived in as we did as unbelievers and then even as new or immature believers. We can't keep living in that way. We have to understand the holiness and righteousness of God because God is absolute holy and righteous and live as God lives in complete perfection, in complete holiness and happiness and peace and contentment and put aside the sin that we did as we were as a new believer or even as an unbeliever. So again, we need to bring the positive volition uh, to, the, uh, to the party, but ultimately God is the one that makes the changes within our lives. And again, that's very uh, important for us to understand. And that's why, again, the Holy Spirit had Paul write verses 31 and 32 in the passive voice. Because everything else was in the active voice. So if it stayed in the active voice, we would just think, well, I've got to change this, and I've got to change that, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. And we would think it'd be all about us. And it would become what? A system of works. And legalism, as most religions and denominations are teaching today. 
But it's not about that. It's about our positive volition to allow God to make changes within our lives, to bring holiness, to bring uh, uh, uncorrupt talk, to bring, uh, 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 rather than bitterness, to ultimately bring happiness and edifying speech within our lives, to bring these characteristics and natures uh, to us each and every day. And when we give God our faith, when we present our positive volition to Him, His Word and Spirit will form that new man and the traits, the characteristics, the attributes, all of that. He will create that in your life. But again, we just have to leave ourselves open through positive volition and let God make the change. But at the same time, Again, we can't think we're just going to live as we did as an unbeliever and live in our old nature and live in the old ways of doing things. You see, we are to express the new man characteristics and attributes to who? Ultimately, to one another. You see, it's not just about you as well. Again, God wants to change your life so that ultimately you have the benefits and blessings of that new life, but also this is a benefit and blessing for mankind. Certainly inside the church, also those who are outside the church. One another, the Al-Anon is the Greek word here. So we're talking about the royal family and our friends and neighbors as well, our fellow uh, family members also outside of the church. So these are the ones we ought to express kindness, compassion, and forgiving. These are the ones we ought to express love to. And as God works these things within our lives, as he, we allow Him to make those changes in the mentality of our soul, get doctrine into the soul so that we're thinking in terms of righteousness and holiness. We're not thinking in terms of, of bitterness and anger and vengeance. We're not doing that any longer. Ultimately, we're now thinking in the terms of God. When we think that way, we'll express it to our fellow mankind. So again, that's why we are to have these things and express them to one another. Receive the action of the verb, express your positive volition to allow God to make these changes within your life, and then you will express these attributes and characteristics to your fellow mankind. And boy, what a better society you would live in if everyone would do this. But what a better society we can live in if we start doing these things, if we weren't doing them before, and then encourage other people to do the same as well. And this is not a system of works, but ultimately it's allowing God to bring that change over our lives. So when we talk about these three traits of the new, new man, as we saw the six traits in verse 31, now we see three traits in verse 32 that are summarization as well. So even though we're talking about kindness and compassion and forgiving, it's really a summation of all the new man characteristics that we should be operating in each and every day. It's a summation, as I also put that word out there, as you know the Bible does, of love towards your fellow mankind, that impersonal and unconditional love that we ought to have. And it's interesting, as I uh, said uh, this past week, we have six things of sinful nature, of the old man characteristics that we're to put off. And the number six within the Bible talks about man. So again, we're to put off our natural man and put on the new spiritual man. And as I also said, the number three is the number of divine perfection inside of Scripture. And anytime there are threes, it's always talking about divine perfection. So when we have kindness and compassion and forgiveness, we are living divinely. And we're doing it through the divinely perfect nature of God and Christ inside of us. So again, we see these fantastic characteristics and natures that we ought to be picking up and putting on. And the first one that we're noting this morning is that we ought to be kind and have kindness towards our fellow mankind. And the Greek word for this is very interesting, which is krestos. And you can see uh, the spelling there up on the board, and I have the Greek next to it. And this word krestos basically does mean to be good, to be pleasant, to be easy, also to be useful for things, and uh, to have respect and be reputable. Kind is another way that it is translated, and sometimes it's even translated as being loving. So again, you see the word love coming back to us once again, having that love expressed towards our fellow mankind. Now, look at that word krestos very closely. And right, right in the middle you see an E, right? Okay. Well, if you take that E out and you put an I in there, what do you have? Christos which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what I find interesting about that is that when you have an I in there, Christos, Jesus Christ is the only one that can say I, because He is the great what? I am. 
So we have an I there for Christos in Christ because he is the great I am. And he's the only one that should say I, I, I because he earned and deserved that because of the cross. He is the great I am. And then when we put an E in there, we take out the I and we put an E in there. What does E stand for? And I'm just making this up because the Holy Spirit gave this to me. But again, E stands for what? Everyone. And you see, we ought to be kind and good to everyone. All right, this isn't biblical. This is the Holy Spirit leading me with a little lesson here. But in any case, Jesus Christ is the great I am. We are all about everyone, okay? And that's why Christos is given this so that we're kind towards our fellow mankind. We're kind to all of those people that are around us. And we see this word used uh, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, regarding our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And here, in regard to Jesus, and we, we saw this verse previously in our studies of, uh, of verse 31, that he talks about his yoke being easy, his burden being light. And that was a great passage in verse, and you can go back and read that on your own, about giving all your cares over to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't carry the load of your everyday worries and concerns, because what will that do? It will just lead you to sin. But instead, when you lay them on the shoulders of Jesus Christ and you give them over to Him in faith, that's when He says, my yoke is easy, the burden is light. Because He's going to carry that for us. He's going to take the problems and difficulties and work them out within our souls. So we see this word kindness here being used for easy in regard to our Lord. The kind nature of Jesus to take on our burdens and take on our sins. And then we also see this word in Luke chapter 5, verse 9, uh, verse 39, chapter 6, 35. In Romans, 1 Corinthians, you can read these on the board. Ephesians, 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 3. And most of the time when Christos is used within the Scripture, it is talking about the attributes of God Himself. It's talking about His character and nature of being kind and loving towards a mankind, and especially towards the believer. And it's only used in our passage in regard to the new man. This is the only time that we're commanded with this word. Again, the verb, I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Uh, the verb is used in regard to the new man. But the only time this noun is used for us to be kind is here in our passage. So again, it's very important when it's just used that one time in regard to the believer in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we are mandated. But more importantly, what do we take away? That it's really this word is used for God, the attributes of God. And what does that mean? Well, we have to understand who God is so that ultimately we can be kind ourselves towards our fellow man. And when we take in His Word on a consistent basis, we know Him. We know how He thinks. We know how He functions. We know how He operates. We know how kind and loving and caring He is for us each and every day. What He did for us at the cross, what He's doing for us in our lives, what He's going to do for us in the eternal state. And when we understand how the kindness of God has been addressed and worked out towards mankind, we then can emulate that within our lives. But if we don't know who God is, we really don't know how to be kind. And we're just going to think we are kind to people, and it's going to be a man-made kindness that really is a pseudo-kindness that we shouldn't be functioning and operating in. But when we understand the absolute righteous and holy kindness that is God, now we can work it out within our lives. And that's, again, why this word krestos is used so many times uh, within the New Testament in regard to God Himself instead of this one time that now it's given to us. And specifically in this passage where we're to put on the new man, take on the Christ-like nature, and have that as we address our fellow mankind. So again, very interesting and fascinating how this word is used and uh, the application of it within our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, it says, If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And again, this is addressed towards Jesus. And if we have, and the, the, the question to that if is, yes, we have. We have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And we tasted it at the moment that we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And at that very moment, we receive salvation and so much more. And we continue to receive each and every day, and we will forever and ever and ever. And the kindness of God was there for us, even though we were His enemies, even though we were wicked, rotten, wretched sinners. Again, we're all brought into this life as a sinful creature, and yet the kindness of God came to us, and we tasted it. 
We tasted it when our sins were forgiven. We taste it each and every day when we confess our sins and they are forgiven experientially at that moment. We taste the kindness of God as He works in our lives each and every day. Now, how God has been so kind to us as a rotten individual, as a sinner and an antagonistic towards Him, shouldn't we be kind to those people in our lives that are wicked, rotten sinners and antagonistic towards us? Absolutely, we should. And we should operate in this type of kindness uh, each and every day. In Luke chapter 6, th verse 35, it says, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He Himself is kind to what? Ungrateful and evil men. And so again, the first, top, uh, the first part of this verse talks about lending and you know, let, let, letting people borrow money from you. And you know, again, it's okay to get paid back for those things. But when you lend the money, you know, have a free attitude about it. If they pay you back, great. If they don't, that's okay too. Okay? But again, you can expect and demand the payment back. We all understand that from Scripture. But free your mind. Free your soul about what this one owes you and what that one owes you. And because you'll always be just going crazy each and every day in regard to it. Turn it over to the Lord. Keep good records. Keep good accounts. You know, check the balances. That's okay to do that. But again, trust in the Lord as you're doing all of that and be at peace within your soul. But the bottom part is what's really in view. Again, He Himself is kind to what? Ungrateful and evil men. And so we're going to see this uh, when we get down to the word forgiveness, probably next Thursday and uh, bleeding into Sunday of next week as well. But when we have forgiveness upon our heart, it's for ungrateful and evil men too. So we're not just to be kind to people that are nice to us, but we're to be kind to all of our mankind. Even if they've done something to hurt us in the past, you can continue to be kind to them. In other words, do things for them, help them if they need help, or give them an encouraging and strengthening word, and especially continue to witness them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God was kind to you first and foremost and saved you from your sins, now we need to be kind from the sinners against us and help them to save them from their sins as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it says, Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. So once again, we see the tie-in of all three of these, but specifically kindness with love, that impersonal, unconditional love for all of mankind. So when we talk about Christos, or Krestos, I should say here, it means that the new man should be useful, he should be serviceable, he should be good ethically and morally, as we see here on the board. And also, when this word was used in the Greek language, it means you were brave too. And it takes a lot of bravery to be kind. Because sometimes you're going to be in a situation where you think you're just going to get a right cross, right, a, right in the mouth, or you know, a punch in the gut, or whatever the case may be. You may come into a situation where you are expecting that to happen. So sometimes it takes bravery to do a kind act towards another individual. Sometimes it takes bravery in order to witness to individuals who were antagonistic or are antagonistic towards you, and especially God. So again, bravery is part of this, honest, merciful, and generous. All of these is how this word krestos was used in the Greek language outside the Bible, and we see the applications for it inside of Scripture as well. And so ultimately, when we talk about kindness, it is often mistaken for weakness as well. And again, many times when people see somebody who has humility and they're kind to one another, uh, they're just a weak individual, or they're afraid because they don't want to ruffle any feathers, or whatever the case. But Kindness is not a weakness. It is actually a strength. And as I just said, the bravery aspect of it, because sometimes it takes a lot of strength to be kind, compassionate, and forgiving towards other people, even when they are unlovable, even when they have been antagonistic towards you, or there's something about them that you just can't stand. Ultimately, it's very hard to be kind to them, and it takes strength in order to do that. Remember, we don't gust, uh, 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 
muster up. That's the word I'm looking for. We don't muster up the strength inside of our soul based on our own human intelligence, but we do it through the power of the Word of God. We do it with the peace and contentment and the happiness of God within our soul. We do it in grace orientation, knowing that God has graced us out from the cross and then continuing in our lives. Therefore, we can have strength to go and face the challenges of people that may be unlovable within our lives and give them kindness and compassion and forgiveness when it is necessary and needed within their lives. So, as we talk about all of this, and before I get into the next one, the tenderheartedness, I did want to share something with you from Oswald Chambers, uh, and I think many of you are familiar with Oswald Chambers. He puts out a great daily, or his wife actually put it out after he died. He died in his early 40s, back in the 40s of appendicitis, was a great man of God, but then his wife took all his writings and put together a beautiful devotional that we still have today that I believe is one of the best. I've seen a lot of devotionals, and you know, they're good here and there, but his just hit the mark, for me anyway, each and every time. And it was interesting because as I was studying uh, uh, yesterday and preparing uh, uh, for today, you know, as I bring up my uh, Bible program to do my studies, you know, the first thing that pops up, and I have it programmed this way, is to his daily devotional to come up. And yesterday, I kind of glanced at it real quick. I said, well, I'm really busy. I've got to put the lesson together. There's a lot going on. I'll just put it aside. But there was something that kind of caught my eye, but I just put it aside because I had other things to do prepare for this message. Well, this morning when I sat down, again, the Holy Spirit you know, said, hey, go back and look at that, you know? There may be something in there. And so I went back and looked at it, and I said, this is fantastic. So I'm going to read you part of that this morning, because what are we talking about? We're talking about allowing God to put off the old man and then allow God to put on the new man. But we're also seeing that we have volitional responsibility in all of this to put off the natural man, the old man, the Adamic nature, to put off the natural and sacrifice that to God. You see, many of you can continue to live in sin and the world just like you did before. We all have that opportunity to live that way each and every day. We can live under the old man. We have that choice. But to put the old man aside, it does take sacrifice. And what is that sacrifice? I'm getting rid of the old man, but yet everybody else is living in their old man. And boy, it's hard for me to live in my new man when everybody else is living in the old man, and I want to live like everybody else. I want to do what everybody else is doing. So to put off the old man takes sacrifice. To put off the natural takes sacrifice. To put on the new man, ultimately, now you can sacrifice in the positive way, in the spiritual sacrifice, to put on the new man. And so as we've been talking about this, the point is, is that we first have to sacrifice the natural in order to give the spiritual sacrifice that God deserves. And you can't put the cart before the horse. You can't go and give a spiritual sacrifice to God if you're still living in the natural world. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. You've got to sacrifice the natural in order to now sacrifice the spiritual. And so that was the, uh, the point of Oswald Chambers' piece. I'm just going to read you a couple of uh, uh, lines from it, and uh, it goes like this. He talks about all of this, everything he's been talking about in the passage, and I'd say all of this, everything we've been talking about in chapter 4, verses 25, now through 32. All of this is the revelation of the natural to the spiritual. The natural must be turned into the spiritual by sacrifice. Otherwise, a tremendous divorce will be produced in the actual life. Why should God ordain the natural to be sacrificed? Question mark. God did not. It is not God's order, but His permissive will. God's order was that the natural should be transformed into the spiritual by obedience. It is sin that made it necessary for the natural to be sacrificed. Now he gives an object lesson. Remember Abraham? Abraham had to offer up Ishmael before he offered Isaac. And remember, Ishmael was his first son that he did by his own power and strength. He had to kind of put off that child first before he could take the spiritual child that God gave him and offer him up to God. I would never saw that before. I thought it was a fascinating principle when you think about he had to put off the natural before he could enter into the spiritual. And Ishmael and Isaac were that example in the literal sense. 
Some of us are trying to offer up uh, spiritual sacrifices to God before we have sacrificed the natural. The only way in which we can offer a spiritual sacrifice to God is by presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. Sanctification means more than deliverance from sin. It means the deliberate commitment of myself, whom God has saved to God. And again, a deliberate sacrifice of myself whom God has delivered to God. I love that part. God did the work so he could give it to himself. If we do not sacrifice the natural to the spiritual, the natural life will mock at the life of the Son of God in us and produce a continual wavering. This is always the result of an undisciplined spiritual nature. So again, if we don't operate and in, in function in the Word of God through the filling of God the Holy Spirit, the natural man is going to keep going, keep going, keep going. And if we allow the natural man to keep going, keep going, keep going, even though we are believers and saved, we won't be able to function and operate in the spiritual life. And we won't be able to give the spiritual sacrifices that we so honestly and earnestly want to give God if we're still living in the natural man. Again, that's why we need to put off the natural man and put on the new, the new man the new spiritual man, the new nature that God and Christ has created inside of each and every one of us. All right, so before we uh, finish uh, this morning, let me get in the next word that we have here, which is tender-hearted and compassionate. And again, on Thursday and uh, into next uh, Sunday, we'll talk about the last one, which is forgiving. Tender-hearted and uh, compassionate. Again, you, splanknos is how you pronounce that word. The G is like an N or an N, almost an NG uh, in the Greek language. So you, splanknos is the word that we have before us. And that is used for compassionate and tender-hearted. Pa- basically, it means that. In 1 Peter 3, 8, we see this word. It says, to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And this is what we ought to be uh, to each and every uh, member of the human race, and especially inside the royal family of God. We ought to be harmonious with them. Again, be at peace with all men so long as it depends on you. Sympathetic. Again, if they are having difficulties, don't just kick them while they're down and think, oh, that's them. You know, I've got nothing to do with that, and, you know, I'm going off on my own way. Be sympathetic with the plight and the condition and the difficulties that certain people have in various points of their life. Brotherly, again, Philadelphia, again, brotherly love, you know, have that kind of camaraderie with your fellow mankind, a kind-hearted, compassionate, as we're going to see and define, and then all comes from a humble spirit, again, the human spirit that's inside of us, not being arrogant within our soul, but having humility of soul uh, uh, based on the grace of God in your life. So when we talk about uh, uh, splanknos, again, And our Greek word in this passage is you, splanknos. You is the prefix that means good, okay? And then splanknos also means to have compassion, sympathy, mercy, and ultimately virtue. So when we combine these things, we ought to have good compassion, good sympathy, good mercy, and good virtue. And what do we mean by good? We mean divine good production. We mean divinely inspired sympathy, divinely inspired mercy, divinely inspired uh, compassion each and every day. You see, we just don't do it under our own power or how the world says we should do it, but we do it as God says we should do it. Again, with the filling of the Spirit to lead us in these things so that ultimately it becomes divine good within our soul. Now, the uh, New American Heritage Dictionary defines compassion as the deep feeling of sharing the suffering of another in the inclination to give aid or support or even to show mercy. That's what compassion is all about. Again, when you have it in the mentality of your soul, when you feel for other people and you want to help them because they need help and you want to do good where you can do good to you know, lift them up, encourage them, strengthen them with the Word of God. That's what compassion is all about. And it has the connotation of having the graciousness that is being worked out within your soul. Again, operating in graciousness, doing acts of grace and kindness, and then you do all of that. Why? Because grace is in your soul first and foremost. You know the grace of God. You recognize the sins that you have committed that God has paid for so that ultimately you can have eternal life. And, you know, every now and again, you know, it doesn't do... 
you know, uh, too much hurt, to sit down somewhere at peace and quiet and think of all the rotten sins you ever committed. <laughs> and then think of how Jesus Christ forgave you for all of those sins and how he'll continue to forgive you experientially as you go forward. You know, again, you don't do it to beat yourself up and, you know, you don't get the whip and, you know, the chains out and stop, you know, smacking yourself and trying to get those sins out of your life, okay? You don't do that. But take an account of what Christ has done for you. Because, again, you know, we go about and live our days, and especially during the holiday seasons, we're busy doing this and we're busy doing that. We've got all kinds of things we're doing here and there, and we're just going about our lives, and we don't even think about what God and Christ have done for us. So, again, it's good to just take an account every now and again of what God has done for you and think of the grace of what He has provided for you and then allow that grace to work out in your life as you give grace to the people that are around you so that you too function and operate in a grace, compassion, tenderheartedness, and that mercy and ultimately the love of God. And we've all experienced that graciousness and the compassionate of God. Again, we all have at least that one same experience that sins have been paid for within our life. We can all go back to that. But then we all have our own personal experiences where things happened and we said, hey, I shouldn't deserve this or I shouldn't deserve that. No way that should have happened. Again, we all have our own unique experiences in the graciousness of God. And we've all seen God work out something or, you know, a, a, some a, a, a function within our lives. We've seen Him work. So again, we've got to think of those times. We've got to recall those times and not just move on and say, you know, I'm just living for today. Again, remember the grace of God in your life and then ultimately operate in that same grace as the experiences of other people come into your periphery, as their plight comes to you, as their heartache comes to you, as their need comes to you. And God provides you an opportunity now to help and support them in some kind of form or fashion. Again, we've got all kinds of experiences, some shared, some individual and unique. We have to recall those things along with the Word of God and the knowledge of His compassion found throughout the Word. Uh, and again, <laughs> I, I just laugh too because, you know, some of these verses, I think I'm going to give you one in just a minute. But remember Israel, <laughs> Old Testament Israel, and how they kept turning against God. And He would just do stuff for them and do stuff for them and they'd turn against them and turn against them and turn against them. But yet He was compassionate on them. He was kind towards them and loving towards them and gave them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And oh, by the way, all the promises that he have given, has given to them, he is going to fulfill, even though they don't earn or deserve it. But that's the grace of God. And so again, we think of the compassion of God. We see it found throughout His Word. We see it dealing with nationalities. We see it uh, dealing with individuals. David and the grace that uh, God gave to him. Again, Solomon, the grace that God gave to him. We see all these individuals and the grace of God that was given to them. We see our own lives and the grace that God had given to us. So ultimately, we take these experiences and then we parlay them into functioning and operating in that same Christ-like nature. So this is why, again, there is no place in our heart for unforgiveness, for revenge, for bitterness, for anger, for jealousy, for any of those things. There's no room for that in the soul of the new man. There's a lot of room in that for the old man, for the old nature, plenty of room. But for the new man, there's no room whatsoever. In the plan of God, no room whatsoever. Not even an inkling, as I used that silly word earlier. Not even a little bit, okay? We've got to put that aside, put it away, and ultimately function and operate in the plan of God. And especially when we see our enemies or those we don't like fall. Again, we have to do, you know, you know, uh, trample all over their dead bodies, okay? But we ought to, you know, have compassion for them and the suffering and the pain they went through, and uh, you know, and also, you know, think about their soul and their salvation, and bring that to them, even the defeated individual that may be in your life. You don't rejoice over their defeat, you know, because you feel better about yourself. Again but you instead rejoice that you can now give them. They're in a place of humility. God's brought them to their knees. Now you can give them the grace of God. He's opened up their heart so that ultimately, or He's softened the heart so that now they can receive these things. Let me give you these three scriptures and we'll close this morning in Psalm chapter 78, 38. 
And again, talking about Israel, but he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them where he could have at any moment. And they deserve to be destroyed all, you know, over and over again. And often he restrained his anger. Again, often we need to restrain our anger. And he did not, and it did not arouse all his wrath. Okay? Sometimes a little discipline needed to come in and to wake them up, but all his wrath, I mean, he could have just wiped them out with, a, with one word, with one thought. And they deserved it because of their rejection. And oh, by the way, we deserve it too because we reject him from time to time. And ultimately, as an unbeliever, we rejected him over and over again. But again, God was kind and compassion and was uh, caring and loving and gave us his grace and gave us salvation. In Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. And you know this one. It's all on the, Christ- on the cards and you know, things like that. Very popular vo- uh, verse. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For His compassions never fail. Again, do you fail in giving compassion? Or, your com- or is your compassion never failing? You always operating in that compassion? And again, for they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. That's how God operates, and He is the new man. He is the man, we could say. Ultimately, we are in the new man, and we too should have a never-failing compassion. Let it be new every morning. Even though they frustrated the heck out of you the day before, and you, know, you just wanted to, you know, uh, you know uh, I'll leave it at that. You just wanted to, uh, okay. You just leave it at that, okay. I'm trying to be good up here, okay. You just leave it at that, okay. And then you go on. And you turn it over to the Lord, and the next morning, you start new and fresh. You don't bring the garbage from yesterday into into today. So ultimately, new every morning, great is His faithfulness, so too should great be our faithfulness as well. All right, I'll leave you with this in Colossians 3.12. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, that's you, that's me, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And that's how we ought to function consistently in the new man each and every day. And we allow God to operate this way within us. We allow him to make the change from the old man to the new man inside of us so that ultimately we function and glorify him each and every day as we again are great servants to our fellow mankind. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer right now. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for creating us in our new nature and giving us that new nature so that now we can function and operate in that new nature. And Father, we just work, ask that you work out your plan and your will within our souls to get the garbage of the old man out and put in the new man attributes and characteristics that we should be functioning and operating in. And Father, we can't thank you enough for all your love and grace and kindness that has been poured out onto us. And we ask that it continues to pour out onto us each and every day, and especially as we travel home this morning, that you give us uh, protection and guidance. So, Father, we thank you for our time being gathered together this morning. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, now, as you know, is our time where we can t- partake of an offering. And again, this is a time where we uh, give back uh, to God in grace uh, based on all the blessings that He has provided for us so that ultimately we meet the needs of our local assembly and uh, our church continues to go forward. So uh, let's just pray for our offering right now. All right, so Heavenly Father, we just thank You for this time to give and Give graciously, Father, and we can't thank you enough for all the blessings that you've given to us, especially being uh, here and living uh, by no account of our own in the United States of America. We just thank you, Father, for all the great and tremendous blessings. We thank you for the word that you have given to us in our church that we can freely come and serve and worship and glorify you. And, Father, we give now this morning so that all of these things can continue according to your will. In Christ's precious name, amen.